All right, it looks like we are mostly back from our break. Welcome everybody. I am Amanda Bachman. I am the SDSU Extension Pesticide Education and Urban Ent Entomology Field Specialist, um, but I am also one of the South Dakota SER co-coordinators. And tonight I am going to be hosting a panel of some of our SER grant recipients that are here in South Dakota, and they're each going to go over uh, some of the projects that they've done, the kinds of grants that they wrote. We'll have time for questions after each panelist, and then we'll also have time at the end for questions. So if you have questions, feel free to throw those in the Q&A box. I will try to keep an eye on the chat, but I would really appreciate it if those questions go into the Q&A box because it's easier to sort of mark them as complete as we're going through. So first thing, I will go ahead and share my screen, cool. Hopefully you all can see my uh, lovely uh, stair slide here. Can I get like a thumbs up from somebody as I try to open up my chat window again? Okay, thank you, Christine. <laughs> So um, these are slides that came from Beth, Beth Nelson and Wayne Martin. So I really appreciate their guidance on this. And I'm just going to go over really quick, um, what is SARE? So Sustainable Ag Research and Education. And full disclosure, I have been with the South Dakota SARE program for a little over a year now, serving in that co-coordinator role. David Karkey is the other co-coordinator. He's based in the Watertown Regional Center. He, he's actually out for a few weeks on vacation. I'm here at the Peer Regional Center. So if you have questions at all about the South Dakota SARE program, you can get in touch with either one of us and we'll be happy to help you out and direct you to some resources. And SARE, as many of you found out in your goodie boxes, uh, we come with a lot of cool uh, publications and goodies that we like to pass out. We have a lot of resources to get some, some really great books and get those out to our stakeholders and educators. And then it's also a program that distributes grant money um, to do some of this outreach and research with a bunch of different audiences. So SARE began in 1988. Um, it's a decentralized science-based grassroots problem solving uh, competitive grant um, outreach program. So we're here in the North Central region, but every other geographic region um, has their own SARE program as well. Um, pretty much every state has a SARE program and it's either through your land grant institution or um, your 1994, your 1890 land grant college. So I was just on a training um, this morning that had SARE co-coordinators from all over the country. Um, and we were kind of talking about what different programs were doing, and I talked up the local foods conference. So maybe we'll have a couple of folks uh, hop on from other parts of the country. So we've got our four regional councils, um, and the SARE funding comes through USDA NEFA. So I'm just gonna, this is sort of the, you know, not super compelling part of what we're talking about tonight. I'm looking, really looking forward to talking with our panelists. Um, but one thing we wanted to kind of go over with you guys is what kinds of grants are out there and also what a successful SARE grantee sort of looks like. And so successful SARE grants, make sure that they cover sort of all parts of the SARE mission. So looking at profit over the long term, stewardship of our nation's land and water, and then also quality of life for farmers, ranchers and their communities. And the SARE portfolio includes a whole bunch of different things. Um, so a lot of opportunities for a lot of different types of growers. Um, so you can see, I'm not gonna read through the bullets, <laughs> um, but just looking at our program for the local foods conference this week, you know, we've got, you know, talking about crop diversification, uh, soil health, uh, small, um, you know, small livestock. I uh, saw the talk about, um, you know, chickens, I think on Saturday. Um, and then some of what I do is, you know, working with um, kind of the urban agriculture side of things, the urban entomology, you know, side of my life. So lots of different things can fit under the SARE umbrella. And you can see uh, North Central region covers where the far west um, and then all the way over to Ohio, there's Northeast, 
south and western. So those are your Sarah regions. So if we've got folks who are maybe joining us from Wyoming, you guys are actually in the western Sarah region. Uh, we're happy to have you though. Um, so there are a couple different kinds of grant programs that SARE runs. And I'm going to go over these in the order sort of by which applications you can still apply for them. We have two of the programs that the grant deadline has not yet passed. So I'm gonna talk about those first. And I did throw the link in the chat before we started to the North Central SARE grants page. So you're welcome to click on that um, and see the two granting opportunities that are still open. And then you can also see the opportunities that just closed. So for the opportunities that have closed, if you missed it, you know, this is a great opportunity to learn more about those grant types and maybe work on preparing an application for next year. Um, but the first one that I'm going to go over here is the Farmer Rancher Grant Program. And this one, um, applications are due December 3rd. So you still have about a month to get that one in. Um, and this is one that is directly funding farmers and ranchers who want to try innovative, sustainable ag solutions. So um, you can see the dollar amount there up to 15,000 for an individual farm or 30,000 for a team. Um, so encouraged to um, sort of collaborate with university or nonprofit partners. Um, and there is an outreach component. So that is one thing that a lot of these grants require is that sort of, you know, outreach education, um, getting the results you know, off the farm and into other folks' hands as well. So if you are a farmer or a rancher, um, this opportunity is still available for you to apply. And then the Youth Educator Program, uh, those applications are due November 11th. So that's like in exactly a week. Um, I have a feeling there's some in South Dakota that are um, applications are being worked on. I've, I've gotten some emails and questions about, about this grant opportunity, but this one is for educators to teach youth about sustainable ag. Um, so if you have a project that you're working on that you, you know, would want to translate to maybe like a lesson plan or an opportunity for students, um, you can get up to sixty up to six thousand dollars per project. Um, and again, this one's like right around the corner. November 11th is when those grants are due. So the other opportunities, uh, the research and education. Uh, program. This is the really sort of large um, grant opportunity. And I think the, the list was actually just released of the projects that were funded um, in the North Central region. And I, I know West River, um, uh, Krista Illert uh, was one of the grant recipients um, in the most recent round of funding. So that's pretty exciting. Um, but you can see these grants are for up to $250,000. So this is the sort of largest um, monetary grant that um, North Central SARE uh, gives out. So can be research or education, um, and they do go primarily to organizations. However, there is a strong preference for organizations that are partnering with, um, you know, farmers, ranchers, growers, producers, um, and then also again, that outreach component. Uh, so for the research and education grants, um, pre-proposals are due October 7th. Uh, this year. So looking into funding for next year, same kind of timeline pre-proposals would be due in early October. And then if you're invited um, to submit a full proposal, those are due in April. So the grant that Dr. Ayler got, her that was last year's funding cycle. Um, and yeah, the funds then become available sort of the next year. So this one is a sort of much longer grant process and you do have to get through that pre-proposal stage. So check out the link. And if it's a project that you're interested in um, or a funding opportunity you're interested in pursuing, um, start doing your homework now so that you're ready when that deadline uh, shows up next year. Um, these grants also uh, prioritize stakeholder involvement. So having those farmers and ranchers involved in the research and outreach. Sarah also um, gives out some graduate student grants for up to $15,000. Um, and those proposals, so this past year, it was an April deadline. So this is one that for 2023 would be coming up again. So if you are um, faculty or have students, this would be worth looking into to get some support for perhaps one of your students. And then we've got our partnership grants. Um, 
And so these are for on-farm research demonstration projects up to $40,000 per project. So there's sometimes a little bit of overlap people will ask like, am I doing a partnership grant or am I doing a research and education? Kind of depends on um, the scope of your project um, over time. You know, if you're looking at doing like a three-year project, that's probably going to be research and education. Um, if you're looking to try out something for a season or two, you might be looking at a partnership grant. So there's, as you can see, couple different kinds of opportunities um, and odds are good that there is an opportunity to fit uh, some of the questions um, that you may be looking to answer. And the final uh, grant type is the professional development grants. Um, and you can see that those have an April deadline. So we've got maybe two thirds of these grants that have fall deadlines and then the other third have, um, have spring deadlines. So. Keep an eye out on the North Central Stair website. Uh, join our email list um, for ways to kind of keep in touch on some of those deadlines because they do, do tend to sneak up on people. Um, and then SARE has an outreach library. I know you guys all got the little thumb drives in your goodie boxes. And those include a PDF, like all the PDFs that SARE has out, I think up through the summer. So that's a really great way you can browse through um, some of that library that's out there. And you know, we've we sometimes have opportunities to get multiple copies of books. So if you are looking for books for workshops or something, um, definitely get in touch with us. We do state level mini grants. Um, so there are some funding opportunities for you know getting folks to workshops um, or doing sort of train the trainer educational events. So definitely check out our website and I will throw the South Dakota website into the chat here when I'm no longer doing a PowerPoint. So I'm gonna stop my share there. That was not, I just, okay. Let me I'm gonna assume that everybody could hear me through all of that as I'm looking at the Q&A now. Um, I don't see my little mute icon. I feel like somebody would have warned me. So we have three panelists with us um, tonight. And our first presenter is going to be Mark Brannon. He's the owner of Benson Bounty LLC. And he is going to be sharing with us um, how he incorporated native plants on his diversified vegetable farm. So Mark, if you are ready to share your screen. All right, how's that look? Um, I can see your, yep. I was gonna say, I'm like, just do present mode. Looks fantastic and I can hear you, so. Take it away, Mark. And if anyone has questions during Mark's presentations, throw them in the Q&A and I'll make sure to throw those at him at the end. Great, thanks so much, Amanda. Thanks for everybody there at the conference for, for hosting tonight. Uh, what, uh, it was truly an inspiring story uh, by Rob. Um, so thanks very much, Rob. A good way to start it out. And I'm really looking forward to some of the other presenters throughout the week, uh, the weekend. Um, I'm really wondering, Rob, if, if it was my Aunt Rachel and, and Uncle Steve from Pocahontas County they're a retired couple who tour breweries. So I'm wondering if that was them, uh, that little anecdote that you shared. Um, as Amanda said, uh, my name is Mark Brannon, uh, speaking with you from Omaha, Nebraska, where my wife, Michelle, and I own Benson Bounty LLC, uh, an urban farm located on one and a half acres smack dab in the middle of, uh, of the city of Omaha. Um, we're a diversified vegetable farm, um, grow a lot of garlic, a lot of herbs, uh, do a big CSA in restaurants as well. Um, like I said, it's an honor to be a member of this forum and I, and I hope my presentation will shed light on some of the, the benefits of incorporating native plants on your own farm. The photo credit for this uh, striking image of a purple coneflower uh, from, from our pollinator garden goes to my wife, Michelle, who in fact won an award in a local photo competition hosted by a, a, local, um, lo a local nonprofit here in Omaha. It was great to it was a great promotion for our business. Just decide uh, 
you know, something that came about because of the SARE project. Uh, Michelle and I started Benson Bounty about six years ago, and we both currently work full time at the farm. In the first years, we relied heavily on CSA and farmers market for the majority of our income. As many of you know, annual vegetable production is a labor intensive enterprise with a high level of competition. With that knowledge in mind, we decided to look for alternative crops where we could be the price, where we could be the price setters uh, instead of price takers. But let's be honest, no matter how good your tomatoes, cucumbers, okra looks in the middle of the summer, the competition's fierce and you likely can't command the price you deserve. Although I'm not sure if you guys can grow okra up in South Dakota. I don't know if you have enough time. Uh, we found some initial success in marketing native, <coughs> native herbs uh, to a local apothecary, which led us to explore the idea further. Uh, that's what led us to applying for a North Central Region Farmer Rancher grant in 2019. Um, some pictures of our farm here. I didn't know if I don't know if I mentioned we have three boys, age six, four, and and two. So in addition to the farm, we have our hands full. Um, that was one of the reasons why Michelle and I wanted to look for some less labor intensive crops as our family grows, we're getting busier and busier and busier. Um, and so, like I said, uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of other farms out there producing just as beautiful radishes as me. And so we wanted to find something where we, uh, a niche in the market. Um, and that's when we turned to Serif. Um, the goal of our project was to demonstrate that there are a number of pollinator friendly plants native to Nebraska that can be utilized to build a stronger, healthier farm ecosystem while simultaneously providing an additional revenue stream. We decided to plant 12 varieties of native plants, many whose native ranges extend into South Dakota to assess whether they could generate revenue on par with annual vegetables. I'll talk about some of those varieties later on in the presentation. On the slide here, I've listed the four benefits or impacts that as a, that as a SARE grant recipient, you can measure to help evaluate results. Basically, if you have a project that fits any of these four bullet points, go ahead and apply because, uh, you know, if you don't get the grant this year, you may get it next year and it'll be good experience applying this year. So as Amanda mentioned, the, the deadline's coming up in a few months, December 2nd, so, so get after it. Um, and like I said, many of these, uh, we decided to plant Many of, the, many of the plants that I'll be talking about extend into, the range extends into South Dakota. Uh, on the slide here, I've got the, the benefits uh, listed and I think it's important to note that in our grant application, we intended to measure the economic sustainability of growing native plants, but ultimately found out that there were other measurable benefits as well, most notably environmental sustainability, as well as social sustainability. Uh, basically, we saved our, we're saving our backs and, and making more money um, in less space. I'll talk about more in depth about the, so, the social and environmental um, after I first talk about the economic aspects. Is, uh, what's going on there? Sorry about that, everybody. I'm gonna fix that for you. I assume that uh, you're seeing the same thing as me. All right, here we go. <clears throat> One of the most pleasant surprises from our project was that many of the native plants we chose for our project served as excellent cut flowers. Not only do they look great, hold up well in the vase, but, they are, but they're also less ubiquitous than say zinnias or sunflowers. And consequently, they're, they're conversation starters at the market. You may also find that local florists appreciate the unique stems that they can't find through their normal channels. We have found that common yarrow and Solomon seal especially are favorite fillers for florists seeking a unique style. My all time favorite plant for our homemade bouquets is blue vervain. I'd like to point out that all of these plants on this list have native ranges but your possibilities don't end there. In addition to growing them for cut flowers, you can grow many native plants for their medicinal value. In fact, as you can see from these two lists, there is a bunch of crossover when it comes to the two, the two categories, meaning that there are multiple marketing channels with each individual plant. As I mentioned before, 
We sell the majority of these herbs to local apothecaries that create tinctures, tonics, and the like. They pay a premium price for locally sourced products that can be continuously harvested throughout the season, multiple times. We've also found that decent, we've also found decent marketing success um, marketing these herbs and flowers to upscale restaurants and bars that utilize them in specialty cocktails and, uh, and mixes. Another revenue stream that was enhanced with the addition of our pollinator garden was the value added portion of our business. Michelle makes handmade balms, salves, soaps, and beeswax candles to sell at market on our website and on consignment in local stores around town. In 2020, we launched our Nebraska wildflower, Nebraska wildflower series of soaps and candles that featured a mix of yarrow and coneflower. It was really popular. Uh, most of our soaps and candles have uh, uh, essential oils in them. This was essential oil free and while we didn't know there was quite a market for 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 that product, you know that even even that extended uh, niche of the market, uh, we found we had great reception with that. We also sell dried teas from uh, made from a variety of these herbs, uh, especially hyssop and, and purple coneflower, narrow leaf coneflower. And finally, we have found that there's also potential to make money by selling divisions from your own plant stock, or by selling seedlings started from save seed. Many of these plants spread quickly and can be divided after only one or two years. Backyard gardeners have a renewed, a renewed interest in, in planting local varieties, but these plants are very difficult to source from local nurseries and non-existent in bo big box stores. We sold out of common yarrow, anise hyssop, and coneflower uh, at our annual plant sale in the spring. Excuse me. One notable native crop that we have added to the garden, but that wasn't included in our grant is Jerusalem artichoke, uh, otherwise known as sunchoke. We grow this member of the sunflower or aster family for its giant tubers, which local restaurants gobble up in the fall. Um, I love see, uh, off season crops. It's, that's why I fell in love with garlic, uh, but I, I truly love sunchokes. In fact, just today I dug over hundred pounds um, from an area about 45, 50 square feet. Um, you know, we charge, either depending on the restaurant, six or eight dollars a pound. So um, you can tell it's a very productive uh, crop. Uh, on the left, you can see some of our market bouquets. Like I said, they were, uh, they're different than the normal bouquets that people would see at market. So uh, they proved to be very popular. Um, that's yar yarrow and Solomon seal in there, a couple different types of yarrow. Uh, next to it, some plants that we had potted up for our plant sale again. Um, that was uh, one of the surprising benefits from, uh, we didn't know there'd be such demand from other gardeners in the area uh, for these plants. Um, for a lot of the plants for our, uh, when we got the garden, when we got the pollinator garden started, some of them we had to drive into Missouri for, and some of them we had to drive into Western Nebraska for, and we're, we're in Eastern Nebraska. So it was, um, it's, they're hard to find around here, some of them. And then again, there's a picture of our, our wildflower soap. Um, like we love value added products because it, it provides a revenue stream, you know, in the, in the fall, winter, early spring. Um, we can get a lot of that stuff done in our off time when the garden's not busy. And then in the upper right there, you see a beautiful, um, Michelle's an artist as well. Uh, and she, uh, she created that, that image for our newsletter. It proved to be a, a really good talking point, a re really great promotional point for us that having this pollinator garden um, and, and we really ran with it. You know, we uh, just recently uh, bought, a, bought about a thousand dollars worth of flagstone. We're gonna put in a, a, put in a patio directly adjacent to the, to the pollinator garden so that next year uh, we can have small events um, at the farm at our most beautiful spot because when we found that when people toured the farm, they were just, they were drawn right there. Um, not just because the beautiful flowers, but also the wildlife, the the butterflies and the bees that are just constantly buzzing around. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, we only intended to measure the economic sustainability of growing the native plants. Uh, but in addition to finding out that there is indeed a market for such products, we learned that there were also environmental and social benefits to including pollinator habitat on your diversified farm. Our established pollinator garden requires far less water and has minimal maintenance when compared to our annual vegetable beds. Um, in fact, this, uh, when we first got it established, we had it on drip. Um, 
but we took that and, and are only using that our annual beds. And this year we didn't even, we had a pretty good amount of rain. We didn't water the entire area one time. So um, and again, it's, it's generating money without that input of time and labor and water. We don't need to turn the beds over each year. And the weed pressure in these beds is minimal. Uh, we keep them mulched pretty well, uh, but for the most part, the, the plants, the native plants thrived and they filled out the space. And so, um, you know, we fit mulch in where we can, but uh, it's really doing well with a lot of, you know, with little maintenance. Importantly, this provides, uh, you know, it's also, it's beautiful throughout the winter and, and importantly, it provides habitat for beneficial insects, birds and mammals, and has contributed to enhance wildlife on our farm. Uh, for us, this was a, a successful project, completely successful project. Not, not every plant that we planted was successful. Uh, butterfly milkweed one uh, was one that was slow to take off. And then, and then we, have a, we have a vole problem here on our farm. And so the voles seem to like uh, to eat, they ate out all the, the roots and we lost that entire bed. Um, and then some of the other ones were slower to come along, but like they're, they're all proving to be um, a good decision, even if they're not quite making, not all of them are making uh, money on par with annual vegetables, but some of them are, are out competing uh, per square foot by, by a large margin. Um, and I, I encourage everybody here listening to apply for a farmer rancher grant this year or whatever grant, Sarah grant fits you. Um, the farmer rancher grant due in December. If you have an idea to solve a problem or improve your farm with through sustainable practices, you just need to go for it. I'm currently uh, on the review committee for our region, the North Central region. And we're always looking for more, more applications. Uh, contact your state coordinator, Amanda uh, or David Karkey and check out the NCR SARE website for other resources. Their staff is absolutely fantastic, a great resource when applying. It's, it's really an easy application compared to um, a lot of the other grants that, I've, that, I've, that we've done uh, throughout the years and, and it's really well set up. So I encourage you guys to go for it. Uh, I hope everyone had a, had a decent time listening to me tonight and uh, I, I'm open to questions now or uh, more later if you think of them later on. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we had one question in the Q&A about selling the plant starts. Um, the question was, did you need to have a special license to sell those? No, we, we didn't. Um, we, we promoted it as a special event and, uh, and had it here on farm over two weekends. And uh, no. And we, you know, we haven't heard from any local nurseries that are upset about it. So. <laughs> An interesting fact, uh, you know, our entire operation is is illegal because uh, it, we're in a gray area in Omaha, Nebraska. It is not currently legal to grow food and then sell it in a residential area. And we were in a residential area uh, surrounded by houses. And so um, we're currently working right now with a, a group of young farmers to to in the, the city planning department to, to work on the zoning code uh, to, to make it legal and to be conducive to growth. Cool, thank you very much. Um, our next presenter is going to be um, Amanda Blair. She is, I think we've got her on. And all right, yeah, Mark stop share. Uh, so Dr. Blair, if you are able to share screen you are going to be up next talking about enhancing producer resources to build small meat processing capacity and local meat demand all right are you seeing that okay yep i can see your slides and i can hear you just great okay well good evening everyone i'm i'm happy to join in on this forum um, I'm going to share with you um, a SARA partnership grant um, that we received um, with um, the, the, lead, the lead institution here was SDSU, but it was a, it's a partnership between um, SDSU Extension and um, several producers. So the title of it is Enhancing Producer Resources to Build Small Meat Processing Capacity and Local Meat Demand. So just to share a little bit of background of kind of where this, this came from and how this partnership developed, um, everybody's probably sick of hearing about COVID, but I want to walk you through um, how COVID kind of spurred this along. 
Um, what COVID did in the meat industry was pretty, pretty uh, staggering, um, to say the least. Um, we definitely saw a decrease in meat processing capacity um, across the country, big, big processors, uh, medium processors, um, and it affected small processors as well. Um, this resulted in a backup of our supply chain um, and resulted in many overfinished animals. And most of you have probably, um, you know, read stories or heard stories about this and, and what was happening um, on, on multiple species. We had um, um, overfinished animals. We had animals that had to be euthanized and it really backed up uh, the supply chain and affected producers in a pretty major way um, on the animal production side. It also exaggerated labor issues, especially for large processors. Um, with COVID in the, these large plants, we saw shutdowns, we saw slowdowns. We're still seeing this um, affect um, those, those large packing plants. That's not to say it didn't affect the small and medium-sized plants, but in terms of meat production on a, on a national scale, um, this really was exaggerated. And then that all culminated in meat shortages at retail. Um, there was pictures of you know, meat cases with nothing left. Um, and, and this really affected then the consumer's ability to, to source protein. So as a result of, of many of these things, it shifted demand um, for, for meat and it really shifted this and, and people started looking to their small local processors. You know, the, the grocery store, store shelves were empty. Um, they, they didn't know where they could go to get protein and many of them started turning more and more to their small local processors and, and trying to get um, connected with um, producers through those processors or, um, or purchase meat through those more local channels. And it also created um, what we feel is a shift in consumer preferences to more of an interest in purchasing directly from producers. Um, you know, we've seen this shift that, you know, there's, there's, you know, no meat at the grocery. How can I get a more consistent supply? How can I source this more locally? And it really has caused consumers to take a look at other options for sourcing their, their protein needs. But this has also created, um, a, you know, I would say before COVID, this was an issue. Um, and I've told multiple groups this, this COVID simply highlighted this challenge. It, it didn't create this totally, but the lack of small processors um, is something that we've been dealing with on the meat side for a long time. And, you know, this, this kind of came together as a perfect storm to show us that we really lack small processors and a, a need to grow this growing demand. And there's been reaction to this. Um, it, it, you know, it, it hasn't gone unnoticed by the, by the industry at any level, at the large, medium, or small processor level. Um, these are just some um, screenshots of what kind of the reaction was. Um, and these are mostly um, news stories where there's going to be large processing plants built um, to add capacity to the the processing sector. But we also saw a whole bunch of small processors being planned or built. And I think this is the headline that kind of sums it up that really drove us to working on this grant was, you know, and it says amid tumultuous meat markets, North Dakota producers take matters into their own hands. And we've, saw, we've seen this across the entire North Central region. You know, we've had multiple calls from producers in South Dakota that, you know, they're beef or pork or lamb producers and they can't get their animals through and there's not enough processing capacity. So, you know, what can we do? How do we build a plant? How do we invest in a plant? How do we, you know, add more capacity? So producers are starting to take this more as a, you know, what can we do? How do, how do we respond um, to this issue? So SDSU, um, you know, we're, we're fielding a lot of these calls, we're trying to help producers that are that are trying to do something and, and solve this issue. And we really focus our attention on the development and sustainability of small meat processors. Um, you know, some of the things that we were trying to assist with is creating additional outlets for market ready livestock. Um, we want to to take this as a global approach to reduce future supply chain challenges and also to enhance direct marketing opportunities for producers. And part of that is resources that we can provide and, and help with. And part of that is, is listening to producers and you know, acknowledging that we don't have all the answers, but we do have the ability to, to pull together resources for people. 
So some of those responses um, from SDSU included um, increasing our, our HACCP workshop. So we've offered HACCP, which is a, a food safety program that's um, needed in the meat processing side of things if you wanna, if you wanna run your plant. Um, we had a series of butcher block talks um, to help people that were interested in, in enhancing or investing in their existing plants and how to do that. We've offered processing short courses, um, provided grant support for existing processors, and then lastly on this list is this SARE partnership grant. And this was, you know, conversations with many producers that were ready to, to learn more, to pull the trigger, to, to start to um, build a business plan. And, and we really looked at this partnership grant as an opportunity to, you know, take what we know, take what the, the producers have as their resources and, and pull those things together. So the overall goals of this um, partnership grant are to establish resources for individuals and groups that are looking to build renovate, invest in, or operate small meat processing facilities. And then also to assist partners with initial business development and then uh, guide some of the feasibility discussions. We fully recognize that, that some of our partners may get through this and say, nope, this isn't for me. Um, you know, I, I learned about it, this, this isn't gonna work, but others may take this information and be able to, to fully execute on, on establishing a new small meat processing plant. So we have five um, main objectives. Um, first and foremost is to familiarize partners with the regulations and requirements of the meat industry. And we've noticed that this is usually what kind of stops people in their tracks because you know they wanna do this, but then they realize that, hey, I gotta figure out um, a lot on the regulation side. The meat industry is heavily regulated. Um, there's multiple layers to that. There's choices to make about what type of regulation you wanna be under. And that takes some education that, that we can provide and some resources that we can connect people with. Um, we wanna aid partners with regulatory decisions based on their business goals. And that goes to some of the decisions about you know, state versus federal inspection versus custom um, and help guiding some of those decisions to best suit what they're trying to accomplish. We wanna provide technical assistance and processing techniques and the skills necessary to operate a small meat processing facility. So this um, really goes hand in hand with, with that education piece of, you know. You know, it takes it takes a skill set that you know, quite frankly, most people don't have in terms of um, butchering um, and and processing meat, um, adding value to that, and um, so those are skills that um, we can we can train folks on. We want to educate partners on proper sanitation and food safety practices, um, and then also assist partners in the development of realistic production goals. You know, just some of that is is simply understanding the logistics and operational. Um, flow of a meat plant that we can help them understand. So this project has two major components. Um, the first uh, is composed of case studies of established meat processors. And we have two case studies selected. Um, this, this grant, I, I guess I should let you know, is something that is just, we've, we've had a summer of planning and now we're getting underway with our partners and, and executing some of these educational pieces. So um, our case studies, we have two of them um, to kind of show two different viewpoints. Um, the first is uh, a case study partner that has renovated an old facility and they are custom processing and also under state inspection. But this particular case study also has plans to build a new processing facility in the future that would be USDA or federally inspected. So visiting with this case study is gonna allow our partners to be able to see a facility that was renovated um, and updated, um, but also talk to somebody that's, that's really got um, dug their heels in on trying to figure out um, how to build a new facility. Um, this case study also has retail space and cold storage space that, that you know, that's kind of some value added side of this and, and marketing aspects that they can share. Our second case study built a brand new facility in 2019. So we're gonna take our partners to this facility. It's custom and uh, federally inspected. Um, this facility has a huge value added focus. So a lot of further process products. Um, they also provide a lot of services in terms of private labeling of your own meat products and co-packing. And then they do retail and online sales. So we're trying to get our partners um, multiple viewpoints from these two case studies. And the way we'll run these case studies is we'll tour these facilities and then we'll have some um, Q&A, um, quite a bit of Q&A time with these 
participate or these case studies and they're willing to open up and, and share kind of the good, bad and ugly with our with our partners. The se second aspect um, is going to be um, through webinars, and these are going to be providing resources. So some of those things, like I mentioned, helping them understand the regulatory aspects, um, what financial um, opportunities are out there, um, operational um, skills in terms of logistics, um, dealing with labor um, discussions with the Department of Labor, um, gaining technical skills. We'll talk about construction and floor plans, harvest and processing schedules, and then also go through, through some business planning. And this is going to be provided through SDSU extension, but also through um, other um, groups and entities, um, you know, industry professionals, um, state agencies, et cetera. And then all of this we're going to take at the end of the project. And um, our plan is to develop an online decision tool uh, for people that would be available to anyone. Um, it'll be a web-based tool. So it's kind of going to be a checklist of here's things that you can think about um, and, and, you know, really help people that are, that are on this path um, gain some more information. The current status of this project is that we have four partners that we, um, they, they came in with us and wrote, when we wrote the grant, they were our, our partners and they've committed to participating in the entire program. We also figured out that this was something that, that could be bigger than just those partners. So we um, put out a, a press release and we were shocked um, at the response. So we have 20 additional participants that are just going to you know, their, their level of commitment isn't the same as the partners, but they, they can participate in the, the case studies and the webinars. Um, so we have selected 20 of those. When we put out a call, we got applications from 13 states and three countries. So this is an area that, that I think there's a lot of interest in acro across the, the country and across the world. Um, so where we're at is we uh, are putting out our initial assessment or evaluation on in November. Um, here in a, uh, about a two weeks, we'll have that collected. Webinars will begin on December in December, and then case study. Our first case study is in January of 22. Our planned outcomes: uh, first, we want to increase partner knowledge about the development of a harvest, fabrication, and processing facility, and increase their confidence in taking that next step toward their planned business venture. So this is really focused guidance for those for for those four partners that we um, had partnered with on the grant. We also want to provide livestock producers with information necessary to plan to establish a meat processing facility. So this is going to be resources that are available for all, all people at the end of the grant. And I think I'm pretty close on time, but we think um, this definitely has relevance to sustainability um, from multiple levels. Um, it's going to, um, the addition of more small meat processing facilities will help um, help money stay in local economies. It also helps reduce transportation of, of animals and that lowers production costs. Um, and that also plays to the environmental aspects um, with fewer emissions. And on the social um, sustainability side, we believe that this um, has a potential to create jobs in rural areas and also build relationships between producers and consumers. And I think in terms of the, the grant, if, if anybody has any questions, there's my contact information. And I think in terms of the SARE partnership grant process, this was the first time that we had done this. And I would definitely encourage anybody that has an, uh, you know, an issue that you believe could be solved through partnership, um, you know, reach out to, to someone at a, at a university or, or anyone that, that you believe could be a great partner for this type of program that kind of has that educational uh, piece. I think we're, we're really excited with where this is going and, and the interest that it's garnered. So happy to answer any questions. We've got one question in the Q&A for you. Uh, it says, with the decrease in meat demand in the state from small plants, how will these smaller plants survive? Folks are shopping at Walmart again, not local processing is expensive on a small scale and most folks in South Dakota can't afford to buy freezer beef. I guess I would say we haven't seen that. Um, I think there, there's definitely going to be people that price shop and, I, and, and rightly so. They need to, to, to get the best bang for their buck and, and but there's we're still seeing a, a heightened demand through a lot of our small processors um, for for freezer beef or direct marketed product um, for that connection with the consumer. So I think 
you know, it's, it's really finding the right customer. Um, there are definitely customers out there that value that, um, understanding where their food comes from, um, knowing more of the story behind that product um, and having that direct relationship. So I, I would fully, fully admit that it's not for everyone, um, but I think there's, there's value in it. And I think, you know, building, expanding our, our capacity across all levels and all sizes of plants is, is really important. All right, thank you. If you want to stick around, we'll maybe have some questions at the very end. Sure thing. So our next presenter is Shannon Mitchell Knaus, and he is the owner of Wayward Springs. And so Shannon, if you are ready to share your screen, I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep, I can see your slides and I can hear you. All right, perfect. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my SARE project here, I called a uh, high efficiency year round greenhouse. Um, the uh, SARE grant number there is listed. Uh, you can check that on the website for lots of details. Um, you can also uh, follow my farm's uh, Facebook page. I post lots of pictures of uh, various plants and animals and things uh, throughout the year. Um, so, Try not to take uh, too long tonight because there's a lot of stuff we could go into, uh, but I'll briefly cover uh, about my research project here. Um, these uh, passive solar greenhouses, uh, if you happen to have ever Googled this, you'll find all kinds of information and maybe an equal amount of misinformation out there. And uh, I guess my background is I'm a mechanical engineer and uh, I designed uh, heating cooling systems for uh, Dactronics. Uh, which is uh, a pretty large company here in South Dakota. We provide uh, big electronic display systems uh, for installations throughout the world. And I uh, did uh, heating and cooling design for those systems uh, for many years. And so uh, I, I really like to grow things and it's really a, an awesome combination of uh, the challenge of uh, improving greenhouse structures and getting to apply some uh, fun engineering to, uh, to growing uh, plants and horticulture. So my project was uh, focused on uh, producing some data regarding uh, the design trade-offs of passive solar greenhouse features and then demonstrating uh, a selected design. I, really my motivation was in our cold northern climates, we, we really can't grow uh, year-round uh, crops uh, cost-effectively. Uh, it makes the greenhouses very costly, especially for tropical and subtropical produce, which has to be shipped long distances. Uh, to our, our climate, if it even makes it here at all. Um, so uh, many of the vegetables from Central America, we, we don't ever get to see in our markets and we don't even know what they are. And I'll share a few examples of those that I've been successful with in the last year. Um, so maybe kind of covering what the structure ended up being. Um, one of the key things about these uh, solar greenhouses, they're usually kind of one-sided with glazing. They have a, a glazing surface that's uh, south facing uh, to uh, optimize uh, solar heat gain from the sun in the winter time because it's pretty low to the south. And then the northern part of the structure is usually an insulated structure um, that helps uh, keep it cool in the summertime when we get way too much uh, sunlight because we have really long days and the sun is uh, a little bit farther from coming from the north. And then uh, it has a, a heat storage system um, that's actually below ground level here. So uh, I've got a few things going on for the cooling. Uh, it has uh, just passive intake vents uh, that open at the bottom and the top. So it doesn't need the fans to cool it during the summertime. And then it has what's called a climate battery. So how that functions is uh, during the daytime, even in the winter, uh, when the sun comes out, the greenhouse will heat up very rapidly and if you, what usually ends up happening is that excess uh, heat gets vented outside. Um, so instead of losing that heat, uh, the system takes that hot air and blows it through a grid of tubes in the ground and heats up the ground using the ground as a heat storage medium. Um, so you can use that heat from the daytime to heat during the, uh, during the nighttime and or cool spells. So, you know, really the question is, 
are these kind of a gimmick? Uh, can you make these things work and can you grow things year round with it? So I have a bunch of webinars out there that I've done already. Um, and I have some links for you guys at the end for that, but uh, this year's kind of overview of the, the data for the entire year of 2020. So I finished construction really about January 1st, got the uh, wiring done, got the fans working. Um, so I started the year with no heat stored uh, in the, the storage system below. So that's kind of nice, almost a, a worst case scenario. And we probably all remember COVID and not so much the weather that was happening in 2020, but we had a pretty cloudy um, January. And so it was really a really nice worst case for us. It was pretty cool outside. And I did have a, a record low uh, for the whole whole time of uh, 29 degrees. Um, and I throughout the whole year, I didn't put in any, um, any access uh, heat source, no, no propane, no anything to, to heat this. Um, so what you see by by the time February came around, our day length started getting longer um, and starting to get enough sunlight that it was uh, getting over 100. Um, and I needed to start uh, venting um, that extra heat out of the system. Um, so I, in, in late February there, I got those vents functioning. I hadn't gotten that wired up yet. And uh, then uh, was able to, to keep it uh, within reasonable uh, temperatures. Um, so then throughout the summertime, um, into the fall really was kind of kind of the good test of the system. Um, so up until you know about the end of September here, early October, so it was heating the greenhouse so it wouldn't fall below 60 degrees. Uh, I turned the thermostat down um, as I wanted to get a little bit cooler. So this is kind of jumping past my stuff um, to 50 degrees, and then uh, through into December. Um, we had low temperatures in the 45 degrees uh, there. So for the whole year, um, the total cost of just the electricity, because uh, that was really the only energy consumed in the system, uh, ended up being $131 um, or uh, 29 cents per square foot. Um, cool thing, was able to harvest uh, ripe tomatoes up until Christmas time. That's kind of cool. Uh, it, what really happens at that time, the sunlight uh, day length uh, is getting too short and uh, they don't ripen up and they just kind of hang out green on the, the tomatoes uh, after after December there. Um, so it's actually the plants are still alive and if you pick them you can bring them in the house and they'll ripen up um, but they won't ripen on the vine. Um, so some of the cool things uh, that have been growing since then, um, figs, fresh figs. I suspect a lot of us in South Dakota haven't uh, ever gotten to have uh, fresh uh, ripe figs. We only know them in fig newtons, but uh, figs are delicious. Uh, here's what they look like. Um, they're a, a subtropical plant. Actually, I found they're really easy to grow um, in this kind of a structure and they'll keep producing. I've had this one for uh, since, uh, since the springtime and he's really been producing continuously since then. Um, it'll be interesting to see here through this winter um, how long it uh, keeps producing. So. Um, here's what uh, here's what a fresh fig looks like. Very unique and, and tasty fruit that probably any uh, South Dakota person would, would like to eat out of hand. Um, another one, uh, citrus is super easy to grow uh, in this kind of a structure. Um, these are fresh limes. Uh, we picked a few of them already. This is this is this photo here is uh, about a week old. Um, so this is about the current state of them. Um, the smell of the flower blossoms are amazing. And uh, the pictures of the little baby limes are kind of kind of cool. You never get to see that in the grocery store. And uh, of course, they taste amazing. Uh, some things that are maybe a little more unique that uh, most of us have never tasted or even until this I had never really heard of um, is uh, Naranjia. It's a uh, the species is solanum, um, so that's uh, that's related to tomatoes. Um, however, they do not have a tomato taste at all, but the growth habits uh, are in some ways similar. Uh, it's a very uh, very tasty fruit. Uh, if anyone happens to be in the, the Brookings, South Dakota area and wants to try some, uh, let me know. Um, these guys are producing uh, kind of fairly continuously at this stage, um, and uh, we'll see kind of how long that continues. 
these are definitely something that you can't grow outside in our climate uh, because their growing season is far too long. Um, these plants here are uh, getting close to two years old um, and uh, very productive at this stage, uh, but not as productive as a tomato, uh, but they're very, uh, very tasty fruit. Uh, something I'm really excited about here is cherimoya. If you've ever heard of cherimoya, um, one of the most famous things you might have heard about it, Mark Twain called it the most delicious fruit known to mankind. I don't uh, know if I would say it's quite up there that high, um, but it's pretty good. Um, they have a very uh, bizarre uh, flower blossom. Um, and, and even in parts of the world where they, uh, they are productive um, in, in that climate, they usually require hand pollination. Um, so that's, that's what I did because when they're flowering, we don't have any pollinators around to do that. And so I was uh, quite happy um, that I actually had very good fruit set. Um, in fact, what I've learned is I had probably too good fruit, too good a fruit set and uh, that kind of limited the size of the fruit and they didn't really get to their full size. Um, so actually just this week, um, they started to ripen up and I got to eat the first one um, well, this photo is from this morning, actually, um, so uh, quite tasty, um, but they're a little bit small and a little bit seedy, uh, so I should have thinned, thinned the, uh, the fruit a little bit more, so there weren't quite as many for my little bitty tree in a pot. And uh, I'd say one of the, the biggest successes that, that I've had is passion fruit. Uh, a lot of us probably haven't uh, gotten to have passion fruit fresh as a fruit, uh, but most folks would have it uh, and be familiar with it maybe in fruit juices. Uh, so a lot of times if you get a uh, tropical fruit punch or something like that, passion fruit is often one of the fruits in that. Um, it has very, uh, very delicious flavor that uh, a lot of folks uh, would really enjoy. Um, and, and the flavor is strong and potent so a lot of times you might dilute it into a juice uh, or a beverage or uh, use it for uh, making something else um, because it is a, is a strong flavor. And a lot of times people grow these just because the flower blossoms are gorgeous, uh, very beautiful flowers. Uh, and uh, once they're pollinated, they produce, uh, produce a very beautiful purple fruit. So one of the other things that I discovered was uh, super hot peppers. Uh, they have a growing season that's it's kind of on the edge for us in our climate where a lot of times just by the time the plants are getting old enough to produce in significant volumes, frost comes and kills stuff. So these are actually a great, uh, great plant to grow uh, in the greenhouse. I kind of accidentally stumbled upon these because um, I let the kids pick seeds out of the catalog and they picked uh, picked some super hots, actually apocalypse scorpions because they thought they looked cool. Um, so I let them plant them and I uh, found there was a market for them uh, locally. And uh, what I found is uh, peppers, they're actually not an annual. We all grow them as annuals because it freezes around here, but they are actually a perennial in their native uh, climate and they will go into dormancy period. So I've got uh, some apocalypse scorpion pepper plants um, that are very close to two years old. And I've got a bunch of Carolina reapers that I added this year and they've been, uh, been beautiful and productive. And in fact, uh, these have been going into Hologi hot sauce. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, he's got a, a pretty cool lineup. He's got a cool story, uh, really starting with COVID. Um, lost his job and uh, always had a hobby of hot sauces and well that now we can get our own local South Dakota hot sauce here with Carolina Reapers grown in South Dakota as well. And uh, another cool success story with that is uh, the passion fruit will be going into a special release uh, hot sauce um, that we'll be able to get uh, coming up this spring. Uh, so a combination of uh, super hot peppers and passion fruit is going to be delicious. I don't know what the, the final name is uh, for the hot sauce, but uh, if you keep an eye out for that, uh, that'll be available. 
Um, you can get it online and he also has a link of uh, stores across the state um, that, uh, that carry the hot sauce. Um, so if you want to learn more uh, about the project and um, a lot of the different uh, things we learned throughout um, the project, uh, there's a bunch of uh, different resources out there for you. Um, of course, on the SEER site, uh, you can see a lot of the materials and the PowerPoints themselves. Check that out. And I did a couple webinars uh, with the South Dakota Local Foods Group and Master Gardeners Groups um, last, uh, last winter time. Um, check those out here on YouTube. Those are recorded and available for everybody to watch. Also had a couple of folks that uh, did some tours of the greenhouse and did an awesome job recording that. If you're not up for the couple hours of webinars of the other ones, uh, check these out. Um, really kind of some cool uh, editing and, and videos showing what I had growing uh, last year in February. And then we also did uh, a webinar uh, with the University of Minnesota. Uh, Dan Handeen uh, is, uh, leads up the Deep Winter Greenhouse Project. Uh, but you got to check that out. They're doing awesome research on, uh, on greenhouse structures for our climate uh, for year-round growing as well. So, yeah, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. And they both uh, involve pollination. So mm -hmm. I'll ask them both to you. Uh, they might answer each other. Um, so the first one is, how many of these tropical fruits need insect pollination? And then do you have to hand pollinate the tropical plants? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good that's a good question, and it's definitely one of the the bigger challenges to growing fruit. Um, so let's see, I, I shared a few things. Um, the those those Naran Gila's actually those uh, it took me a while to figure that out. Um, I did have blossoms that that weren't getting pollinated, as well as I could not find any good resources out there on how to hand pollinate them. Um, so. Uh, the, my first uh, first summer, I, I ran with most of the with most of the vents closed. Um, definitely, this summer was very warm, um, so I pretty much used them continuously, and so uh, I had plenty of insect pollinating them this year. Uh, but they did need hand pollination uh, when they're blooming, um, and uh, pollinators can't get into the structure. Um, the citrus are are very easy to to hand pollinate just with a, a paintbrush, um, and the passion fruit. Uh, that's that's definitely something to be aware of. Uh, there's some cultivars that are not self-compatible, uh, and some cultivars that are. So you want ones unless you're growing multiple plants and and have enough to cross-pollinate. Uh, you'll want a cultivar that is, is self-pollinating. And I did hand pollinate um, most of those. So it's it is a, a something to plan for and a time commitment with fruit. Uh, some fruit, of course. I uh, don't need hand pollination or pollinators, um, such as tomatoes and peppers. Um, those are all, all wind or, or maybe just tapping the plant uh, can pollinate those. So uh, those, are, those are good options if, if you're not, uh, not uh, interested in uh, being a pollinator yourself. <laughs> um, so next question, have you had to use supplemental heat in addition to your earth battery system in the colder winter months? Mm -hmm. So my first year of operation here, I was very careful to not use any sort of outside heat source. Um, I did not use any grow lights or anything that would um, introduce um, any other heat because I didn't want to taint my data. Maybe I'm an engineer and a little bit um, of a stickler in getting accurate data. Um, so, um, so yeah, I did have on that, uh, that plot there, I did have one day that it hit 29. Uh, which is, is deadly to many things, um, but many plants it's not deadly to. Um, actually, uh, the citrus is not a tropical, it's a subtropical uh, that does handle freezing, um, and the same with uh, passion fruit. Um, however, um, other things like uh, tomatoes and peppers are a tropical that do not handle freezing very well. Um, so, yeah, good question. Um, so I did this last year, um, I don't have data compiled in a pretty graph yet, but we did have a week or two in February where if you guys remember, we had like minus 30 uh, or more uh, below zero. And I just didn't want to take the risk that maybe uh, maybe it would freeze um, because I had too many plants by that stage. Um, 
and it would be way too costly. Um, so what I did do um, just as some insurance during those nights um, was just used a small propane tank, like a grill sized propane tank with the smallest heater I could get. Um, and I, I just ran that overnight um, and that easily, easily kept things uh, in a safe region. I, even though it might have been okay without. <laughs> I can see why you wouldn't want to risk it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then the final question here, uh, we've got um, Cindy, who, if you have any extra Reapers, uh, she'd like to know her phone numbers in the chat. Um, but she also wanted to know what the cost, uh, what is the cost on the greenhouse? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So um, for the total for this structure, um, I spent just just under 20,000. It's a, a 16 by 28. Um, so not not super big. Um, I would say it's, you know, it's a nice size for maybe personal growing for your family or something. But um, I could grow a lot more reapers if I had a lot more space. Um, so it's, uh, it's a good size for that. Um, I did do all the, the, the design work and construction stuff myself, um, other than pouring the foundation. Um, so that's maybe not figured into that, that cost. And who knows, materials and supply chain stuff seems to be difficult nowadays. I, I know I've heard of a few people uh, trying to build things um, and running into roadblocks there. Um, let's see. Yes. Um, and then, and we are at like 837. So I'm going to ask this last question and then um, the panelists, if you guys want to throw your contact information into the um, chat so that people can find it, um, but we will work on wrapping this up. Um, but the last question is, do you use forced air um, for your earth battery? Yeah, yep. So um, in order to get uh, enough uh, heat storage, um, you do need to use uh, fans. Um, this structure has uh, four fans. They are uh, not centrifugal, they're vein axial fans or axial fans. Um, a centrifugal blower uh, would be uh, better for a system where you have more back pressure. Um, and, and I designed this intentionally to not have that uh, because I want to have a higher velocity um, airflow. So uh, I, I don't know if I've got a good enough info in my other webinars and info for someone to, to fully design one on their own. Um, but if you're, you're interested and have questions or, or want me to help you out on designing one, um, definitely you can reach out to me. Cool. Well, awesome. This is super interesting to hear from everybody about your projects and what you've been doing with your SARE grants. And it's just really incredible the diversity of projects that you can get funded through SARE. So I encourage everyone to uh, check out the North Central SARE website. We've got our panelists, uh, their contact information is popping up in the chat. Um, so I wanted to thank all of our panelists um, one last time, and I believe tomorrow, I got to cheat and look at my schedule and see when we start up again tomorrow, but we start at noon central, 11 mountain on Friday. So for those of you that are going to be joining us again tomorrow, we will see you back here on the Zoom. And I don't know if uh, Carrie or anyone else has any last words before we um, head out tonight. I see no other panelists like running in to say things at the last minute. Um, I'll say have a good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you again tomorrow. So enjoy. Thank you.